So I was re-watching Edge Runners the other day and I was transported to another time in my life. The sounds of rebellious indie jams from the mid-aughts, Franz Ferdinand, when tracks like Do You Want To were all over the airwaves. Those dancey jams weren't exactly the first thought I had when it comes to future dystopias, but it fits. But that got me thinking, why are there these international bands in anime? This isn't even the first time Franz Ferdinand has been in an anime. Do they like it or something? Oh, okay, well, probably not then. <laughs> but what about all the others? Because they are definitely not the first British band to be anime. There is quite the list of them, and I think today we're going to look about how that all happened. However, this episode will be a nightmare to edit because of all the licensed tracks. I don't know how I'm going to get through that red tape. So thank God we have a sponsor today, and that is Squarespace, a website platform to help you with your brand in the digital space and make your website on top of that, which is going to look real nice. So this new year, I've made a website for my art and animation stuff. Lucky Squarespace has got me covered. They have video storage that is native to the website. So you get 30 minutes of high definition footage for free on that website, which gives you the options for all kinds of content without any restriction. But also if you've got it somewhere else, you can always embed it from Vimeo, YouTube, etc., etc., And it's easy to set up. Hey, if it's your videos, if it's your images, if it's your blog posts, you have flexible website templates on this website. It's very easy to do and you've got a lot of customability that comes with it, which is going to make it look professional regardless of what you're trying to make. So you can get a free trial at Squarespace today and when you're ready to launch, you can get 10% off your first website or domain with the link www.squarespace.com slash Stephen. Thank you very much, Squarespace. Let's get back to the video. Well, you have to go back to the 80s when you can see a couple international bands moving into the medium, notably Gilbert O'Sullivan. So it was actually the Irish that did it first. But according to the director, it wasn't a popular choice for Kitty Records, who were trying to cross-promote the song. So his tracks were only used in a couple episodes before they were ripped out. But in the 90s, that's where things really start to open up when it comes to that trend, and we start to pile in the British artists. So it's been about a year since the third anime boom started in 1997, which brought a more international audience all over into the distribution. A little band called Boa was approached by certain members of a studio called Triangle to see if they could get a single in one of their shows. And, you don't seem to and it was the perfect match with the great visuals that set the tone. It found the band a whole entire new audience around the world. Boa were on Japanese label Polystar, who were able to get them in contact with Yoshitoshi Abe, and I guess the rest is history now, as they explain here. I wish I had a really interesting story about this, but I was in Japan when um, the A&R guy said that he knew that somebody who was working on an anime had heard Duve and really liked it and wanted to include it. And we were like, great. And so it came from there and it was all kind of fresh and exciting and bang. There. Duve has happened to reintroduce itself to newer generations again and again and again through the internet. TikTok even bring the band out to do a remake and a new music video and go on tour and possibly release a whole new album in this decade. And it's not surprising because we're looking at almost 300 million Spotify listens on that platform alone. Not to mention stuff like TikTok where it's found new fame going beyond the original anime audience entirely into completely different spheres. But even the success of Duve in the 90s led singer Jasmine to be hired to make two songs for another cyberpunk anime. Armitage 3 Dual Matrix. Okay, we've got a little addendum here, so I've got to pause for a moment. So these tracks are not actually featured on the movie for whatever reason. They ended up only on the CD, although there is a smaller oddity instead I'll give you. So the original theme for the first OVA is called Phantom World. In the English version of the OVA, it was actually released with an English cover by a different artist, though they were still a Japanese woman. But in the sequel, Holly Matrix, the theme is now covered by a British singer, Maureen Davis. So is this just like a cyberpunk thing? Well, maybe it's more likely there because it is technically a Western genre originally. And because of that, there might be a vibe associated with it, which means that English voices just seem right for those kind of openings. But generally, it's actually someone like in the production committee who will make the decision of what's gonna be in the opening and ending. It might be a tie-in for one of the other members of the production company if they're a music studio and they've got something to cross-promote. But also, it can be the creators, if that be the director or the producer at the studio, or a specific interest in the original creators that might get you, you know, a different artist than you might expect. 
After all, Japan is the second biggest music market in the world, and it's not unusual for people in Japan to listen to music from all over, and even take influence from it if we're talking about things like city pop. There is this old stereotype called Big in Japan, where sometimes aging musicians or musicians that are a little bit more niche can find popularity in Japan, but maybe not in other places, but they end up booming there. Uh, there's some really specific choices in that area. Say for example, Nolans, who are an Irish band who had the first international Japanese number one in the country, as well as have sold almost 12 million plus albums, which is pretty staggering when you look at it in comparison to other artists uh, in Japan. And I'm reminded that when I was growing up, one of my friends told me that his dad, who was in a punk band, actually had a similar event happen to them where they had some international fame in places like Japan and otherwise. Um, and they were planning to go on a big tour because of it. But unfortunately, during that era of time, they were all beyond middle age and had families, you know, free kids and stuff. So it didn't quite work out like it maybe, maybe they would have hoped it would have, but still, you know, fun to think about. But when we're talking about taking advantage of that audience buzz and doing cross promotion, you might see the returning Franz Ferdinand with their hit in 2005 or their second LP, Well Do You Really Want To? That track was used at the ending of Paradise Kiss, and guess who's on those key animations here. It's Imaishi himself, the director of Cyberpunk Edge Runners. Maybe that's where he got an interest in the band. Well, I think it's important to mention that when it comes to the music of the opening and the endings for Cyberpunk Edge Runners, that was actually chose by CD Projekt Red, not Trigger. Although, you know, it's possible they were also fans. What I do notice here is that Imaishi has captured the essence of the band. Their ethos was to make pop music that make girls dance. So there you go. All right, speaking of more cyberpunk, we have Ergo Proxy from director Morisse, who brought unconventional musicians into his directorial projects. During those peak anime years, they were looking for the sad boy, depressed anthem to go with their cyberpunk dark show. Radiohead's Paranoid Android. And yes, I am definitely the target demographic for this band. It came from their album, OK Computer, which is still their best-selling album to this day at about 8 million copies. But Mangalove is not exactly the biggest studio in the world, so would they be able to woo Radiohead onto this album? Luckily, it seems someone in the band was receptive to their PV, which got them the green light to use it in the ending. If I had to guess, maybe that would be Radiohead's guitarist, Johnny Greenwood, who is the resident anime fan, as you can see by his guitar. Well, you never know, it could have been Tom York, maybe he just really liked the moody vibe. But even if right now in 2006 we're in the DVD boom and everything's going well, what about the future? Is there going to be issues by having these sort of popular tracks within your anime? Well, preservation can be hard for companies if they can't work out deals for re-releases. When Ogre Proxy ended up on streaming, Paranoid Android was removed. Now, there is a question of though, what about physical media? Well, I have heard that at least on the Blu-ray, it has been retained. So, whew, thank God there, right? But is that always going to be the case? I know there are definitely issues with other projects. Say for example, Evangelion never really paid for its international rights for the song Fly Me to the Moon, which means that it will basically never ever ever end up on another international release of the project. Well, there's always the alternative, which might be getting in a famous musician, but to actually make a song specifically for the project. You know, you can make an agreement on that one there. Q. David Sylvian, who was the head of the band Japan for the longest time, but he also does some work with Ryuchi Sakamoto on the soundtrack for Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. Specifically on the song Food and Colors. That's a real bop. I did wonder how someone as reclusive as David ended up on the ending theme of the anime Monster. And it seems he has quite the particular answer on his website. I was attracted to Monster's material by the moral dilemma faced by the central character. The calm surface of the music is giving way to a dark undercurrent, signifying the consciousness of the lead protagonist, and the themes of morality, fate, resignation, and free will. So I guess, yeah, he, he seems to have known the source material more than most of the artists on this list. He is quite the eclectic talent, and his solo career shines brighter than what is seen. I really think most people should check out more of his work. Um, honestly, really fantastic. Okay, so I've got another addendum for you. Monster actually had two sets of licensing issues recently. One with streaming websites, and then also with the German Blu-ray. None of these have the sung version of this theme. They only have the ending instrumental. So I guess, you know, this is actually the ideal path after all. But we're not done with Madhouse yet. 
They've also worked with the opposite side of the spectrum, with people who are the small independent artists looking to get their work to a wider audience, if we talk about something like Gunslinger Girls. This was the Dalgottos, whose fourth album was on Mantra Recordings, which was a subsidiary of Beggar's Banquet Records, who were responsible for their international distribution, and likely were the reason the track ended up on the show entirely. It doesn't seem like the band themselves are that familiar with the source material, calling it some kind of manga thing when asked about it. I think shortly after that album came out, the band did a breakup, so I guess it didn't do them any massive favours. But I think they're back together again, so that's nice. Okay, I swear we'll stop talking about cyberpunk soon enough, but Technolize has a Juno Reactor on its soundtrack opening. They're probably most well known for their work composing the Matrix soundtrack, especially on the later entries, but they also worked on the Animatrix, which again, Madhouse had worked on, so it seems there was a connection point between those two that ended up getting Technolize that Juno Reactor opening, which I guess, you know, if you're looking for something for your cyberpunk show, you can't go wrong with something that actually connects to the Matrix. Although I could never find anything about the band actually talking about their experience working on that project and specifically, it's actually quite rare to see a band give more of a reflection in terms of why they went for it, how it happened, but also how they felt about it in the long term. But this time with Mushushi, it's a bit different. The composer I believe is called Ali, another Scottish talent worked on the opening soundtrack. Ali made a Tumblr post about his experience not only getting on Mushishi, but also how he feels about it after so many years, the long-term sort of reflection on it. Starting with saying that it was someone in Japan on the animation side that told him a producer or director had his album and they liked the song and they thought it fitted the vibe and they sought it out. It was as simple as that, I guess. He said yes. But when he was asked if it bothered him that the song had now become commonly known as the Mushishi song, he had this to say. It doesn't bother me at all. I love writing music and I want people to hear my songs. And using the songs in this way allowed people to discover my music. Anyone that likes the song can quickly and easily find out who wrote it and what the original title is. My hope is that if they enjoy the song, they'll go and check out any other of my 34 or so songs I've released. And of course, when it comes to copyright issues, as well as the long-termness of the channel. Really the best way of supporting will be Patreon, and I've got to thank my patrons right now. That'd be Lenny, Tim J. Richards, Stratogen, Stratos, Chunks, Jay, Fox Mulder, OT, Paul, Seamus Mum, Subsofa, Systematic, Karen, Nick, Doji, Peter, Agor, Vic, DTB, and newcomer Van Sam. Also, thank you so much, Lenny, for the footage from the Monster Blu-ray to show that licensing kerfuffle. Anyway, let's get back to it all. Love you all. A lot of the songs we've looked at are, are fairly contemporary from when they released, or they're from people who are kind of like workmen or people who are quite still in the field. What about if you want something that's maybe, I don't know, 20 years old or something? Well, that's when we get to talk about Speed Grafter. Look at this one. Girls on Film. What a great song that is. You know, I'd, I'd actually like to, I'd like to listen to it right now. Give me a sec. Take this out and put my DVD play here. How, how is this possible? Physical media, you fucked me over! The fuck, man? Do you know what I mean? I bought this shit. I feel like I'm in lied to. Well, I guess even physical media can't save you in the end. Well, what if you were to take, I don't know, the Stranglers punk band, and you took the bassist from there, and you then made them the composer on the soundtrack, because then you can't get rid of them, as well as doing the opening and ending. Well, then you'd exactly have what happened with the situation of Gonzo's adaptation of The Count of Monte Cristo. Gonzo themselves had kind of an interest in internationalism as they sent their anime all over the world for a satellite deal. And that was until they like got bankrupt a couple years later at the market crash. That's when all the DVDs also went bust. That all seemed to align specifically as things were kind of mellowing out in the late 2000s with the release of East of Eden, which itself had a cross promotion with Oasis's final and last album for possibly forever, kind of making it almost both a dying band and a dying breed. 
But I guess the avenue for this sort of stuff didn't die that long. Because by 2010, we can start to see there's a bit more money coming into anime movies. And while they're not as interested in this field, there are some interesting oddities. Like in 2010, the space show got Susan Boyle to do the theme. And as the 2010s went on, you can only see those numbers go up. You do start to see some funny things like, I don't know, very specific pop rock from Canada being in One Piece. But really we need to go to 2016 as a real pivotal point in that movie scene, as the year that Your Name really blew everyone away in terms of the amount of money it was making. But the same year, another film came out called A Silent Voice, and it was a big deal for Kiwani. It might be the biggest film they'd ever released in terms of the money and the soundtrack and the effort that went in there, but it sounds like the producers left them to it, and they were able to sort of set out what they wanted to do musically, next to the storyboards, together all at once, which led to almost a British invasion of The Who? very unorthodox choice for this little opening montage. Though I never really got the impression that movies were as interested as perhaps TV shows were, just because there's the sort of repetition aspect of it. And when it came to the streaming era, a new avenue opened up quite surprisingly. And there was a really specific franchise that took the most advantage of that. Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, a series that was really popular in Japan but didn't quite pick up in the uh, English-speaking countries until this adaptation. There was one specific thing that they had decided on musically before anything else, and that would be the ending theme. And to me, it was actually quite a surprise when I heard it because I myself am quite the Yes fan. It was Roundabout from the album Fragile. I used to listen to this stuff when I was running around when I was younger and doing a bit of a jog, you know, because these songs, they're like a journey. They're very expanding and moving features, which made me think, well, doing that with a song like this is gonna be quite difficult for the, uh, the anime because it doesn't have that like start point. There's usually a big building element to it. So in the end, they started to use it in almost thematical ways where the soundtrack would bleed into the anime and create a sort of build up to that to be continued, which in itself became a god awful massive meme in the anime culture to the point that David themselves started referencing it in their own previews for new series, alongside it having a thousand and one other references in other places. Hey, you wanna end the show with a to be continued meme? I, I don't even know what that... But you can certainly see that there was an expression of a new generation being introduced to this English prog rock like never before in a way that it would have been very unlikely to happen otherwise. If you've ever looked at the yes comment section now, it is basically ruined. Well, why specifically yes though? Well, the author has a passion for music that is international. That's certainly clear from the work of Jojo. But he also left a note with his editor about the kind of music he was listening to during the making of each part of Jojo and Roundabout just happened to be chosen for Phantom Blood. The sound director was also pretty happy with his choice as he was a fan of Yes himself and definitely worked hard into incorporating it in ways that are just right. As the Jojo parts kept coming in, we started to see more and more ending themes, but most of them actually weren't from English bands, but they were all international at the very least. Until we get to part six, which is where Duffy comes in with their ending. Now part six also is very unique in that it happens to take, let's say, the whole story in a roundabout, wink, as the final episode brings back Roundabout, which was quite a surprise that they do it just for one episode because of the licensing costs. But that might be because they have extra money coming in from Netflix. Yes, Jojo was a pretty big deal on streaming services like Crunchyroll, even got itself international play in things like Adult Swim. But when it came to part six, Netflix bought up the rights exclusively, and now you can only watch it on their service, which led to some controversies in terms of how they were releasing it. But I don't think anyone's going to be complaining about them bringing back such an iconic song for the final fitting finale of those six parts. Which really shows that you can use these musical cues for more than strictly just a, oh, I know that song. This was actually really playing into the world of JoJo in a way which many other outros and intros didn't quite take advantage of. Which is probably what makes it so special and maybe why it appealed to so many fans. 
But you know, Netflix didn't really stop there. Their investment into anime led to a lot of extra money being thrown into it for ONAs, and that's when we get all the way back to the start with Cyberpunk Edge Runners and its international albums. But yeah, it's not the first, it's not the last, and Netflix has just kept doing this and doing this and doing this, and they're sure many examples, even to the point of like The Great Pretenders, which is literally named after the song which is in the ending. I'm really sure when the new season comes out in about a month's time, they'll have some other Freddie Mercury song in the ending, if not the same one again. You can't stop them until, well, the bubble burst, I guess. The streaming revolution here has only taken advantage of the international audience's intrigue or interest in the Japanese creators to be able to do stuff which before might have been a little bit more difficult. I mean, I think one of the most interesting examples, which technically is in English, but still worth bringing up, would be Scott Pilgrim, which has pretty much a mixtape of tracks from Canadian and American bands within the show, during moments, but also has a different theme for every episode in terms of its ending. Only one that was British though. And I haven't seen such a selection of tracks since, I don't know, um, Jewel Pets? Which did occasionally have some things like the Beatles in the background for a couple of shots here and there, and other kind of parodies of musical sections, which really you could only get through the power of being Sanrio. So no, there is no grand conspiracy, there is no British people brainwashing Japanese people into forcing them to use their album tracks for some reason. It's just random people on these productions who are probably pretty passionate about specific types of bands and music that happen to be from places that aren't Japan. Oh yeah, and I guess there's some money involved too in terms of like these production committees, but you know, mainly about the passion, mainly let's focus on the passion for now. That, that, that feels better, that feels nicer as an ending. Now, if you excuse me, I'm gonna go listen to my pirated superior copy of Speed Grapher to hear the true opening of the show, Girls on Film. I'll catch you next time.